All right, so computer problems, hopefully off to the side. Psalms 149. Coming down to the final stretch. We did every single chapter, including Psalms 119. Oh, praise ye the Lord, ye plural. Closing the book of Psalms, I think maybe we've got the point that what we're supposed to do is praise the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. What's a new song? One that you've come up with your own heart. It's not looking for, you know, the Christian billboard top 10 or, you know, what's this musical group? What does this singer have? It's you singing to God, not being written down, not being recorded, but you just come up with a song for God, for God, of God, and nobody else. I said, you know, when you're reading your Bible, YouTube, one hour instrumental hymns classical music, read that with your Bible, and just let your heart sing to the Lord. And his praise, his praise, God's praise, in the congregation of the saints. That would be a, that would be the classification of the church today. Not the church in the Old Testament where we are now. There is no church in the Old Testament. But we were going to spiritually apply this application, this scripture to us today. We're supposed to praise God. Boy, is that far in the churches today. Let's bring in worldly entertainment. Let's bring in worldly... Let's entertain the world while everybody's allowed. Come on in. Everybody's welcome. In Revelation chapter 3 says, Jesus Christ, God himself, is standing at the outside of the door knocking. The church is full of pride. I, I, we have great things. We don't have needs of everything. We're just doing great and fine. That's pride. When we go to gather with the saints together, whether it be a church house, someone's house, wherever we gather, where two or three are gathered in the, in the name of Jesus Christ, there he is among us. We ought to be for the praise of God as his saints. The church gathering inside the church building, whether it be at whatever it is, you know, it should be like the city's a refuge. Get out of the world for a while. Don't bring that world into the church. Tell the world, get out and tell Jesus to come in. This is about, you know, it's going to be no filthiness, no billboard, no sin, no cussing. Just as clean. I mean, listen, no church is perfect, but let's be as clean as we can be. It's clean. For God. And there are some churches, you go and they got belly dances, they got they got rock music, they got rapping, they got men buns, and they got that's the world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Take the world and give me Jesus. been hitting on Jehovah Witnesses a lot, but let's hit on the, on the saints. Let's hit the Catholic Church. According to the Catholic Church, a saint is someone who's died. How can a dead man praise in the congregation? you got a congregation of dead people? If you're the Catholic Church, you've got a congregation of dead people. I've been in the Catholic Church. I've met many years growing up in the Catholic Church. Ugh, dead. You got a bunch of, uh, of beans around the Catholic Church. You got eyes they can't see, ears they can't hear, nose they can't smell, mouth they can't talk, hands they can't move, feet they can't go anywhere. It's a dead congregation of the Catholic Church. But the Bible's thing is a man that is alive, is a woman that loves the Lord, is alive. What about when they die and go off? Uh, Jesus said to, I believe it was the Pharisees, he said, or the Sad, no, he said to the Sadducees, do you not know that God said that I am, the, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob? God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Now you got a dead church, you're going to bring up dead relics and dead things. Get out of that dead church. Let Israel. Ooh. 
Israel, the people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, not the spiritual Israel, not the church Israel, not, you know, when I was born, you know. Let Israel rejoice in him, God, that made him. Who made Israel, God? Let the children of Zion, that's the mountain, be joyful in their king, capital K. God, Jesus, the Lord. What did Pilate write above the head of Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. What did, the, what did Pilate's men, when they when they put the, the crown of thorns in his head and the purple uh, robe on his head, oh, hell, the king of the Jews. What's that vesture he's going to wear? <coughs> Dude, I got a sore throat. What's that vesture he's going to wear when he comes back? King of kings. Lord of lords. Let them praise his name and dance. Now dance is only 26 times in the Bible. And the proper biblical dance is women with women and men with men. And not sodomental pleasure either. I had a guy one time in prison. He said, you know, he said, what, what, what if my wife and I dance at home? All right, you and your wife dance at home. You're not nowhere else. You're not. Mixing around with other couples. She ain't going to dance with anybody else. You ain't going to dance with nobody else. You ain't going to be doing the boogie woogie and all that kind of stuff in, in the public. If you want to, you know, put on some music and be a husband and wife together and, and love each other. All right. But there's dance in the churches today. Perverted. Let them sing praises again. Unto him, God. This contemporary music is crap because it could be, in, you know, that, you know, there's these, there's these, I'm not going to say him. There's these songs put up, these contemporary music. It don't have the name Jesus. It could be, you could take that song and give it to your girlfriend and say, this song is about you and I. And she, oh, thank you. Supposed to be about him. The, the hymns of praise is supposed to be about God with a timbrel and heart. Again, he mentioned the heart early, and I made the statement. And I hope you can play it. For the Lord taketh pleasure. Uh oh, how do I please God? In his people, and that's Israel. That God put a thing on the Jewish people. Abraham, Isaac, and it was passed on to Jacob. I will curse them that curse you, and I will bless them that bless you. You take care of my people, I am happy, God says. You, you do my people evil, you got the wrath of God. Listen, uh, uh, was it Matthew 25 or 26? Come now in, in, into, into the millennium for, for you fed me, you, you took care of me, you visited me. And they're like, when do we feed you? When do we visit you? When do we take care of you? He says, when you did it unto one of the least of these, my people. And to the wicked, he says, depart from me into eternal judgment, because you didn't take care of me, you didn't feed me, you didn't seek me, you didn't help me. They're like, when do we didn't? He says, when you didn't take care of my people. God took it personally. And God also takes it personally, Jesus Christ, to the Christian. And he told Paul, why persecute thou me? Paul didn't do nothing to Jesus. He was out there killing and maiming and, and torturing and getting Christians to confess not Christ. Don't mess with Christians and don't mess with the nation of Israel. Israel pleases God. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Meek is absolutely total opposite of pride. He'll bring the pride down low. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Kind of hard to be joyful if you're dead. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. 
Again, Catholic theology, Catholic tradition. I hope the dead body ain't in bed. You know what the problem with the Jehovah Witnesses and the problem with the Catholics and the problem with Islam and the problem with the... They don't read the Bible. And they believe the morons of their hierarchy of their religion more than they believe the Bible. And Jesus said, that, you know, the tr your traditions are against the Word of God. But the high praises of God be in their mouth. And a two-edged sword in their hand. What's that? I had a guy today. Oh, well, I'm going to grab my gun. Said, yeah. You know, Peter tried to defend him. God told him, put that, put that sword back in the sheath. Two-edged sword in their hand. <clears throat> to, execute, to execute vengeance on the heathen. You notice at the end of verse 6, there's a, it's either a semicolon or a colon. Verse 6 is not finished without verse 7. A two-edged sword to execute vengeance on the heathen and punishments on, upon the people. To bind kings with chains and their nobles with fetters and iron. To execute upon them judgment written. This honor have all the saints. You gotta put, I'm gonna carry a, a weapon. Well, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 all go together. So, let's see what Romans 13 has to say. Romans 13. When we get context with content, studying rightly divine the scripture. I'm gonna make one statement and it's gonna just, hey, you, you, you do whatever you wanna do. Pray about seek the scriptures. But if you were to kill a lost man, defending your house, you will send that lost man into hell. Well, you know, if you call the police, they don't come on time. Then once you get your voting rights, get out there and fix the system. If the voting and everything works. See, voting doesn't fix anything. I had somebody break into my house while we're sleeping, go in each of our rooms and take notice who was in the room, sat here at this computer, did a couple things on the computer, stole our car. Did you get a gun? I had someone tell you should have had a gun. I didn't have a gun. God had, she left out the front door, stole nothing. He said they stole the car. The car was in the neighbor's, neighbor's driveway. And the keys were in the car. I have no gun. I have no sword. God protected me. And then when you go to those kind of things, you have it red boxes, book of martyrs. So let's look at Romans chapter 13, and where do I want to go? Verse 4, 13, 4 Romans. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. You're going to break the law, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute. Does that sound familiar? That's what we just read over in Psalm. Now that's 13.4. Let's start in 13.1. Let's get the whole context. Let every soul be subject to higher powers. For this country, that would be the president, the senate, the house, and then, you know, mayors and governors. Anybody in authority. The boss. For there is no power but of God. I don't like my boss. 
God put him there, and God's in trouble. I don't like that political candidate, or I don't like that political party. I don't like that person that's in office. God's in charge. God put him in office. No, we voted. Oh, you saying your voting has more power? Oh, I wanted him in office, but those little Americans down there voted me out so they can. Oh, man. You better be careful. What if you vote against God? What What if the one you want, God's like, I don't want him. Let me get off of get on that. Oh, oh, yeah. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained by God. That terrible, nasty boss that you got. That rotten mayor of your city. That cop that pulled you over. That judge wouldn't let you go away. Your parents. God ordained, ordained, ordained them. You know what? You know what you do with your minister or your priest or somebody's gonna get behind that pulpit of your church assembly? He ordained them. You know what God does with the powers that you don't like? He ordained them. And God don't care if you don't like it. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power. I see resistance all the time of Christians, of Democrats on Facebook. Resistance the ordinance of God. You better confess your sin. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. That ain't mean you're going to go to hell. You're going to get trouble and problems. By the way. What we're reading right now, the governor of Rome was Nero. You remember one of the nasty stories about Nero? He burned Rome down and blamed the Christians. You know, Nero would have would have outdoor parties for all his people. And he would take Christians and stick them on a post or a stake, and he would set them on fire at these parties and say, look. The light of Christ is. That's the same ruler that Paul's talking about right now. I think this. I think Nero would be a lot worse than Pelosi or anybody in office. And you'll see Paul ranking. He's a, he's a subjection. For rulers are not a terror to good work. I'm not bothered by them. I'm a law-abiding citizen as far as I know. But to the evil, wicked doers. Now, America's got that absolutely, absolutely wrong. What's going on in Portland, these rioters and these lawbreakers are allowed to run wicked and run against the law while people's businesses and homes and cars are being destroyed and they're innocent. God is going to hold every single one of those people that's in charge of Portland and in charge of America. He's going to hold them up and say, why did you allow the evil? And you better believe the office of the president is going to have to stand too. Not just the governor, but the president because he's in charge of all 50. We're talking about the law. We're talking about the powers that be. We're talking about a bunch of innocent people who are getting their houses and their lives destroyed while they sit back and let the, the guilty and the evil. It says, rulers are not a terror of the good work, but the evil. The ones who are going to break the law are supposed to be afraid of the law. You know the ones who are afraid that are, are the evil doers? You know the ones that are lawbreakers and they're winning? We're going to defund the police. Defunding the police and allowing the criminals to run is against Romans 13. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the powers? They're not. Listen, the President of the United States, whoever he is, has not the power of a king. You know what the kings of, of Europe used to? If they didn't like you, you were gone. 
was the King Henry and all the wives he had killed? He didn't like it. All right, kill him. Our presidents have no, no such power. Do that which is good, and thou shalt be praised of the same. For he, every power that be, is a minister of God. As much as your pastors in the pulpit, so are even the Democrats. For good. I don't think it's good. Did God ask you what you thought? I don't think so. For if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Not Chicago, not Washington, D.C., not in Portland, Oregon, and other places. For he beareth not the sword in vain. You know what America does not do anymore? Well, very few. They do not apply capital punishment. That's what that sword means. They do not do execution because look, for he's a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. It is the power of the government. You violated a crime that's worthy of capital punishment. I don't care what the Catholics say. I don't care what they say. If you're worthy of, of, of the capital punishment, you, on this set date, you're going to have capital punishment and you're not going to sit in jail and rot. Which they do in America. Because when we go all the way back to the blood of Abel, God said that blood of Abel cries out to me. And you know what the problem with America is? There's a lot of murdering blood that cries out to God as the murderer sits in jail and has food and lodging and clothing at the taxpayer's expense. Don't say God bless America. Because America is living against God and against his word of God. And you better believe I'm getting this point out. Satan has blinded you with politics. But look at that. Go back to Psalms. Let's read what we, let's read what the sentence and see if it matches what we read. Verse 6, Psalms 149, verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to the Gentiles and to the Jews, to bind their kings with chains. Even if the, if the king's guilty, put handcuffs on them. To the nobles with fetters of iron. That's kind of leg irons, uh, arm irons to execute that's why we call it execution execution is a bible word that we've gone against the bible and we've gone against execution we have come so cold in love that if a loved one gets killed by somebody else well i think they should just you know you have no anger of a crime that has been done to your family to execute upon them the judgment written if it's written in law this honor have all the saints the saints are supposed to be praise ye the Lord let's look at Matthew 22 13 Matthew 22, 13. You know another problem with Washington, D.C.? They make too many laws that no one follows the laws that they make. They don't enforce the law. We have a law, I don't know about your state, we have a law in Florida you're not supposed to use. It is illegal to use a cell phone while driving. And we've got whatever police department we got, we got them out doing petty stuff and they can't pull cars over. 
We don't have enough of police for it. But the police force can buy these RVs and these big camper plays and all these expensive vehicles and they can do all this kind of expensive stuff and get, you know, the, the, the sheriff department and the captain get expensive uh, uh, salary and stuff like that. But we can't afford the more police officers. Spend the money in the wrong place. He says, verse 11, 22, 11. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man which had not a wedding garment. This is this is after the second advent. He said, Friend, how came thou hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. This is this is this marriage supper of the land. This is Israel coming in to the land. We've been married to Jesus Christ, the, the church. He invites Israel in, and there's somebody who doesn't have a garment. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot. Does that sound familiar? Take him away and cast him in outer darkness. Hell, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So go back to Proverbs. Verse 6. And I'll show you something interesting about this chapter. Verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and two-edged sword in their hand. Oh, wait a minute. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Two-edged sword in their hand. Revelation 19. Where do I want to read? Do I want to read it all? Do I want to Verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that it should smite the nation, Gentiles, heathen. He shall rule with a rod of iron. He shall tread at the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. That's the second advent. When Jesus Christ comes back the second time, he ain't coming back to the little baby. He's coming back to the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, let the high praises of God, Psalms 149, be in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand. Christ has already come back with the sword in his mouth. To execute vengeance on the heathen. That's the second advent. Punishments upon the people, the Israelites. To bind their kings, king of kings, and chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon judgment written. Where is it written? It's written in, in the Bible. It's already written. What to do, what not to do. This honor have all this all his saints. Praise you the Lord. Look at Psalms 149 to 5. That's millennium. That's the millennium. You see it? You see it? Singing and praising. Look at Psalms 6 at the end of the verse. Two-edged sword all the way to verse 9. That's second advent. The psalm is right. Hey, the greatness of the millennium is coming. Woo -wee, it's going to be great. <laughs> but let me remind you, just before the millennium, that, that, that Messiah coming. He coming back angry. That execute means fulfill or follow through completely. That's what it is. When we go into the millennium, before we go into the millennium, you've got judgment. And there will be nobody going into that millennium. Unless they pass the judge. And if they don't pass the judge, they're not going to millennium. 